we have had people who have stayed in them for over 20 years when they're supposed to have gone in for a matter of months. Um, and we have had uh, all sorts of terrible things happening, such as a young woman uh, living in solitary confinement in a bare room, being fed her meals through a hatch. Um, and what I should also add is that although we have a bit of a focus on assessments and treatment units tonight, they're not the only places where abuse can take place, and there are other places, as you'll hear from George, uh, where abusive and neglectful incidents occur. Um, a programme was set up um, back in late 2015 by the government and the NHS called Transforming Care. The aim was to get the vast majority of people out of assessment and treatment units and into good supported community settings. There were 2,600 people with learning disabilities and autistic people living in assessment and treatment units back then. Um, and now, eight years later, there are 2,060 by the latest figures. So really, we have come nowhere near to getting people out of these units in the way we should have. Okay, that's enough of me and my introduction. So I want to introduce our first speaker tonight, and we're enormously privileged to have um, Alexis Quinn. Um, Alexis is um, an author, uh, a teacher, um, and uh, an autistic woman, and mother, and uh, Alexis spent three years in a succession of assessments and treatment units um, some years ago um, after suffering a health crisis until she actually escaped, and you heard me rightly, she said, I said escaped, and fled abroad, yes, fled abroad, uh, to get away from the uh, services that she was um, trapped in. Her incredible book, uh, which is called Unbroken, um, describes her experiences um, at that uh, time. And actually, we've got copies of it on sale downstairs. So I'm flogging books tonight as well. So, um, and I can guarantee you it's a fantastic read. And she's recently published um, uh, a book aimed at um, autistic uh, parents-to-be uh, called Autism and... Autism and Jumper? Autistic and Expecting, sorry. So, Alexis, over to you. Well, thank you, Simon, for that generous um, introduction, and it's really, it's really wonderful to be here today. So, you know, as Simon said, I'm an autistic person, um, and I was detained in 12 different uh, mental health hospitals um, all over uh, the country, um, from, you know, the south right up to, to, the, to, the, to the north of England, um, for almost four years. And as, as Simon said, um, in my fourth year, um, I was... Uh, offered a, another year stay um, <laughs> and it was at that point that, that I decided to leave. So when I entered services I was a grammar school teacher, um, also a performer professional athlete but also a new mother um, and recently uh, bereaved of my, of my younger brother. And what I would say from meeting people um, all over the country in lots of different um, hospitals and lots of different securities is that every single person, every single autistic person, person with a learning disability, had suffered some tragedy or some crisis in the community that required a measure of support um, and compassion, which unfortunately um, wasn't available. So like many others who went before me and many you know, who, who are subsequently going after me, um, and, and I guess for me now, um, living in the community, I always feel like you know, I'm one meltdown um, away from admission. My, my passions when I entered the system were recast as obsessions. My logical thinking was recast as rigidity. And my sensory needs were seen as, as pathology. And so literally, you know, as soon as those kind of airlock doors, you know, closed shut um, and I entered a, a medical um, institution, a medical setting, I was recast as sick, you know, ill, defaulty, you know, um, deficient and, and really um, a danger uh, that, that required to, to be controlled. And I would say what happens in those institutions, and we, we could blame the sensory environment, you know, we could blame the nature of them and certainly that's a part, you know, of why things haven't, haven't changed is that you know, you, you'll have a sort of perhaps a sensory overload or a cognitive overload or you'll express some measure of distress. And that is usually met with a form of restrictive practice. 
And then what happens, you know, is because of the restrictive practice, you know, it creates more anxiety, okay, it creates more distress, you get layers upon layers of trauma that accrue, and so your distress ends up getting a bit bigger, which is met with a bit bigger restrictive practice, until, like me, you enter this kind of distress coercion cycle that looks like overload, meltdown, restraint, overload, meltdown, restraint, over and over, multiple times a day, hundreds and hundreds of times, thousands and thousands of times, until really, you know, you kind of lose, lose your, your, your sense of self. So certainly the sensory charge nature of these, these wards, these hospitals, and I would say really, you know, the, it's, a, it's a, a, a warehouse, you know, really masquerading um, as, as a hospital, um, a, 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 can, can be sort of responsible um, for that in a sense. And, you know, when you are being restrained, you know, it's usually sort of six to ten you know, men sometimes for many hours, you know, holding you down, um, you know, removing your, your underpants and injecting you, you know, um, with, with powerful um, antipsychotics that would eventually induce, you know, after many hours of restraint, you know, a longed for um, sleep um, in the seclusion room where you will be hot, you know, sticky, you know, and, and, and sort of battered and bruised. And for me, you know, in solitary confinement, you know, I would wait. Um, really for the experience to be repeated. You know, it, you knew that when you were in there, that it was only a matter of time before you were going to be outside and that kind of um, distress coercion cycle that, that I described would, would happen again. But it's in there for me, and I'm sure these guys will talk more sophisticatedly about some of this, some of this stuff, but for me, it's in solitary confinement that we actually get the most obvious key um, at least on a personal, right, an interpersonal level, to the problem. I was eating with my hands um, on the floor. There was no furniture. There was only the standard issue blue NHS mattress. In some of the places, some of the seclusion rooms, solitary confinement suites, uh, we might call them, there's no bathroom. So you're toileting on the floor and you might be spending many hours next to your excrement. You might be eating next to your excrement. There was never, in some of the, the, the rooms I was in, which I was in for many days, sometimes weeks, a natural light. There was no access to, to any kind of fresh air, not even a window, um, to, to, to press your face against, to, to, to breathe that in. And so you didn't know if it was day or night, and you didn't know sometimes how many days had passed. And a lot of the time there wasn't a clock in there, so you really had no idea. You were really lost um, in space and time. And when you're not interacted with, and when you're not perceived by other people, you become unable to perceive yourself. This is, it's basic, isn't it? It's basic. It's, it's back to sort of Winnicott, isn't it? When, when the, the baby's mirroring the parent, you know? When, you, when you're not perceived, you, 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 don't know you're, you don't know you're there. And so at times, I would throw myself against the walls, you know, to see if I was still alive. I started talking to myself. I experienced heightened sensory perception, and I grew really fearful, really fearful and distressed by interaction. I feared that door opening, because what was happening is I was being forced to, to adapt um, to, a, to a pathologically sort of deprived environment, and actually you, you become that thing. Um, now these, you know, predictable, actually, you know, research for decades and decades and decades actually back to sort of 1975, there was a guy called Tock who, who talked about um, uh, uh, isolation panic, you know, from moments of, of, being, in, of being in these rooms, um, were then used to justify and maintain the isolation. And you know what I hear all the time, which is really irritating me at the moment, is autistic people, people with learning disabilities, they like to be alone. They like to be alone. Actually, <laughs> you know, what happens is, you know, the, the, the way that we're treated, that accrual of trauma, of trauma, of trauma, of trauma, little bits of trauma like, oh, there she goes again, that kind of stuff, right? Little things, benign sometimes, insidious little things, are actually more hurtful than the big kind of obvious restrictive practices. And their accrual and their accrual is really painful to the point at which you actually come to believe that you're all of these things that you're being made out to be, that you're some, you're some mythological monster, so for me, that's the key to what it is that we're talking about tonight. How is it that people come to be treated in this way? And for me, it's actually it's about the othering. 
that goes on. At a fundamental level, you are not like me. That, that's the message. And parts of me, as I've just described, were objectified. They were actually, I think, detested you know, and considered you know, at times as, as requiring um, eradication. And I'd like to um, just tell you a little bit of a story. Some of you might have heard it before, so I apologise if that's the case, but it's probably the most powerful example that I've got of what it is that we're talking about, or what I'm talking about tonight at least. And I was being transferred between two hospitals, okay, two secure hospitals. So I was moving from, from a low secure to a, 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 a psychiatric intensive care unit, which is a, a low secure as well. Um, and I've been folded, you know, I'm quite, quite tall, I'm six foot one, I've been folded into this caged vehicle, which looks like a dog cage, okay? Um, and you, you can't stand up in it, like, it, you know, it's like a car, you know, so you're, you're in this cage and it's all white and there's lights shining on you, uh, it's quite clinical. And my hands were, were handcuffed behind my back and my legs were strapped at the knee and they were, stra they were strapped at the feet. So I was completely, if you can imagine, you know, completely sort of tied up and, and folded in half in this, in this car. And I was sat on a narrow um, uh, plastic bench with no seatbelt. So if you can imagine that. It's a four hour journey from York down to, um, down to Kent. And I was crying, you know, it's very distressing. Um, and uh, when I arrived, um, the four staff that travelled, four staff, four staff travelled with me. And the, I wasn't allowed out for the toilet, so I was also soiled um, and, and, and wet. And they, they got me out, and there were two staff on this side of the, of the can you imagine, they, they opened the doors. Um, there's two staff on this side and, and two staff on this side. And I'm standing there, you know, and I was crying, covered in oh, goodness knows what else. And what's interesting about this is, what, their, what do you think their perception is? You know, their perception must be of some, some risk, some illusory risk that I pose all tied up. Because what can I do, really, all tied up for four of them, you know, to be standing there? Or some mythological monster. And this nurse came, who I'd known from a previous, a previous time I was in this intensive care unit. And she said, to, she said to these staff, she said, take those handcuffs off. You can see the staff looking at you. You know, what, you know, what, what, are you for real? You know, is this really, is this really a thing? And they were, you know, sort of very reluctant. And then she had to repeat herself and she said, take those handcuffs off. So very reluctantly, they took the leg straps off, they took the handcuffs off. She gave me a big, a big hug. And she said, it's okay, Alexis, you're safe. It's okay. Now, this story is really important because we can choose, can't we? Each one of us can choose what kind of person we want to be, how we want to interact. We can choose within the confines of our laws, of our politics, of our institutions, you know, of the CQC, DHE. We, we can each choose to see similarities in people. We can choose to observe one another's humanity. Or we can choose to look at risk. We can choose to believe these medical narratives, these othering narratives. And that's what that nurse did for me that day. And do you know how healing that was? It was so humanising. It was so healing because the message that I'd had up until that point, sat in a cage, covered in my own experiment, was that I was nothing. That was nothing. I was shit on somebody's shoe. And that nurse, I, I'll never forget that nurse. Now, just to finish, you know, just to say in the therapeutic sense of the word, I would say that that nurse showed me love. If we define love as the ability to accept the entirety of a person without diminishing any part of them, that's really important. We need to stop objectifying people's behaviour, challenging behaviour. What are you talking about? person's distressed. How can I help you? What can I do? How can I make things better for you? And until we can engender acceptance, compassion and love, which we've often beaten out of people by the system, you know, I was talking to George earlier, from the age of six months, when kids aren't rolling over at the right time, there's something wrong with them. They've heard all of their lives, they're not meeting milestones, there's something wrong with you. What's wrong with you? Why are you behaving like that? So we've often beaten those qualities out of them. And until we can engender those qualities, just as that nurse did for me, every single part of me, 
not just the parts that are valuable, right? Alexis is a teacher, right? Alexis is an author, Alexis is, you know, whatever. Not just those bits, not just those bits that society finds acceptable in me. Because believe me, even now they don't find lots of, lots of me acceptable. Just last week I was in handcuffs. At every corner and at every level of the system, you know, and so the question for me is, it's not how do we transform care, but a better question is how can we humanise others? Because I think when we humanise others, then we'll start transforming care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexis, and what an incredible story it is. Now, I, I wish it was just a story and, and it wasn't the truth, but it is the truth and it is what happened. So, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is Sarah Ryan. Um, Sarah is a professor of social care at Manchester Metropolitan University, and she's also the mother of Connor Sparrowhawk, who is known as um, Laughing Boy, who you'll be hearing um, more about when she talks. And Sarah is also an author. She's the author of a book called Just Justice for Laughing Boy, which is about the um, incredible campaign for justice which occurred after Connor died while in the uh, care of an assessment and treatment unit. Um, since then, Sarah's also written another book called um, uh, Love, Learning Disabilities and Pockets of Brilliance, in which she has tried to identify those things which can work in the way people relate to people with learning disabilities, autistic people, and so on, um, to ensure that these sorts of institutions aren't needed. So, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm actually going to read. I'm going to read something out that I've written, which I don't usually do, but we've got ten minutes, and I thought it was safer. Um, so, last week was the ten-year anniversary of Connor's death in an NHS-run ATU in Oxford. He drowned in the bath while the staff did an online Tesco's order in the office next door to the bathroom. Ten years has given me time to think about what unfolded and why, and different aspects have become more prominent over time. Um, given we have around ten minutes to talk, it seemed appropriate to produce ten points of reflection around what happened to Connor and others and to think about what the lack of any real shift in the use of ATUs, given Alexis's graphic description of what these places are like, um, what this lack of shift means. So, one. Connor was a beautiful, much-loved, funny, talented, wonderfully complicated young man. He loved deeply and contributed so much to our family and wider that we're left with a chasm in our hearts, in our lives, and hearts so full of love, I can sometimes hardly breathe. Two. The day we had Connor admitted to the unit, a mile or so from where we lived, I didn't know Winterbourne View was an assessment and treatment unit. I didn't know what an assessment and treatment unit was. I thought we were taking Connor to a specialist NHS hospital unit that would be staffed by uniformed and identifiable health professionals just for a few weeks to understand why he'd become so distressed and unpredictable. Connor had loved visiting his granddad at the JR hospital just weeks earlier, so he went quite happily. The local medic who came to our home to assess Connor beforehand even said there would be a war drown that evening. I'm not sure what this not knowing, this ignorance, means still. There was so much we didn't know then, and there's so much that people still don't know. Three, Connor was admitted on a Tuesday evening. The responsible clinician, whose office was just across the car park from the unit, in a, in a building literally directly opposite, didn't bother to walk across and see him the next day, Wednesday. She didn't go on the Thursday or the Friday. On Saturday, she went on leave for two weeks. Again, we had no idea about this. There was no war drowned. There was no crisis specialist intervention. There was no urgency, information, or interest. There was nothing. Just our boy catapulted from his family home into a space that defies words, again, as we've just heard. And this was apparently fine. Four, we met the lead paramedic who responded to the call that hot, sunny July morning in 2013. 
before we moved from Oxford in May 2021. He was a friend of a friend of one of our children and he asked to meet us. He said the ambulance overshot the turn for the unit that morning. There was no one outside directing it. When they arrived at the unit, the door was locked and somebody was painting the windows outside. He remained bewildered. Even when we met him, he was still bewildered by the lack of urgency and by the absence of any information from those present. He said his team had nothing to work with. There was nothing to base their treatment decisions on. The staff were literally clueless and said nothing. There is no pretense of health care, death care, or any care in these places. And this is apparently fine. Five. After two years of health and local authority records being disclosed and four pre-inquest hearings, Connor's inquest that George Julian was live tweeting was unexpectedly halted in week two. The responsible clinician's barrister produced evidence that another patient, Henry, had died in the same bath a few years earlier. Photographs of the bathroom taken after Henry's death were shared with us. Some of the same staff were on duty the day Henry died. The lack of disclosing Henry's death for over two years is nothing short of extraordinary. It was only raised to try to get the responsible clinician off the hook. A second psychiatrist present the day Connor died looked at Henry and told the coroner by telephone that he died of natural causes. There was no post-mortem and no inquest. When Connor's inquest ended, the coroner asked for Henry's death to be investigated and the police took witness accounts from those present. The student nurse who was with Henry said he was told to leave the bathroom by professional X before the ambulance came. Professional X said he didn't arrive at the unit that morning until the ambulance was there. The coroner said it was a long time ago and there were bound to be contradictions. He dismissed Henry's death again and this was apparently fine. Six, a death review commissioned by NHS England on our request was conducted by an international consultancy firm, Mazars, led by Marie Ann Bruce. It found that in that trust, only two out of 327 unexpected deaths of patients with learning disabilities were investigated between 2011 and 2015, that was. This report provided unassailable evidence that you can punt human rights, regulatory procedures and processes off the nearest bridge when people with learning disabilities are involved. And this is apparently fine. Seven, we don't know how many people have died in assessment and treatment units. A dispatches film by Alison Miller, Under Lock and Key, shown in 2017, included the story of Bill, who died alongside two other patients in 2011. His parents, then in their 70s, were given what they described as blood money after an inquest found out he died as an outcome of neglect. That is, he died of constipation. An early morning roundtable meeting was organised at Channel 4 the meeting up the morning sorry, after the documentary was aired. There was an expectation that there would be a Winterbourne View style outcry. No one really cared. There was no furore about this documentary. We were coasting downwards by then, slowly and carefully unmaking scandals. I sat next to Bill's parents, who were pretty quiet throughout the meeting. I wonder what they were thinking of that early morning shindig in central London that turned to nothing other than further in evidence of bridge punting. Eight, there is no doubt that ATUs deprive people of their freedoms and rights and worse. This deprivation manifests in myriad ways from being restrained, over-medicated, secluded, driven for four hours in a, in a cage, uh, to being denied the most basic opportunities to walk in nature, experience the wind on your face, or have a drink with a mate. Abuse, disrespect, and devaluing profoundly erodes well-being. We know this. <laughs> Wiseman and Watson in 2021 wrote about the complex forms of violence experienced by people with learning disabilities and how these are critical to understanding the significant inequalities in health and well-being experienced by this group. <laughs> and yet the number of those incarcerated in ATUs remains the same. Nine. 
The unmaking of this scandal, the greedy and self-interested actors that have jostled to drink at the fountain of self-serving opportunities and nosh on the plates of croissant crumbs to line their pockets, seize media opportunities, including stuffing laminated photos of dead loved ones in the hands of battered and bereaved families for the camera is grotesque. And I'm going to read that out again because this is a really key point. The unmaking of this scandal, the greedy and self-interested actors that have jostled to drink at the fountain of self-serving opportunities and nosh on the plates of croissant crumbs to line their pockets, seize media opportunities, including stuffing laminated photos of dead loved ones into the hands of bereaved and battered families for the camera is grotesque. There has been no auditing of the money spent since Winterbourne View was first aired by Panorama. There's been no auditing of contracts dashed, doshed out, time wasted, individuals rewarded for no success. We know these places are trauma generating, and yet a paper published just this year found that just under 50% of 44 admissions and discharges from two ATUs between February 2019 to March 22 were delayed. The most prevalent reasons for discharge delay were the identification of a new placement, recruitment of care staff and building work. Two young men close to my heart have been in and out of ATUs over the past decade. One is currently back in an ATU while the other has been waiting years for Oxfordshire Local Authority and NHS England to sort out a home for him. Both families have been the driving force at, at extraordinary emotional, financial and physical cost to get their boys a life worth living. This is apparently fine. Finally, Ten. I was struck by Simon, our Simon here, mentioning at a conference just yesterday that the exclusion of people with learning disabilities during the Industrial Revolution, when enormous institutions were built, was arbitrary, as many people could have worked in factories. There is a direct and re remarkably <coughs> enduring line from then to now where we have people formerly incarcerated in ATUs or in versions of ATUs dressed up as supported living or residential homes where people don't even know their neighbours and their neighbours don't even know them. All our lives are impoverished by the exclusion of a proportion of the population and the way in which we as a society are failing people is something we should all take responsibility for. None of what we're talking about this evening is fine. None of it. Stop pretending it apparently is. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, I mean, we've just had two incredible pieces of testimony and um, it's very difficult to know what to say. Um, you've just heard them. Um, so we will move on to our next speaker and we've been asked at the back to make sure we all keep our microphones very close to our mouths so um, sorry if we if we haven't all been doing that. Um, so our next speaker is uh, George Julian. Now George is an award-winning journalist and she specializes in um, uh, commentating mostly on social media from investigations, inquiries, and inquests into the deaths and abuse of people with learning disabilities and autistic people in um, ANT units and uh, other places. Her aim in doing this is to ensure that injustices against people with um, learning disabilities um, and autistic people are actually told and are in public view and are not hidden away, as we just heard from um, Sarah talking about the consequences and the aftermath of the Channel 4 documentary. So over to you, George. Thank you. Is this microphone close enough? I feel like I'm eating it. Um, I knew it was going to be a hard gig to follow Alexis and Sarah, but I am an emotional mess. Even though I've heard them speak many times before. So, um, you're just going to have to endure me crying. Right, pull yourself together, George. Um, so, I was asked to talk about what's happened and what's happening now and what we need to do about it. So, for context, I'm George, and in October 2015, I live-tweeted Connor's inquest. 
This was a um, last minute decision when Connor's family barrister suggested that we did it because we'd have this kind of online campaign, Justice for um, Laughing Boy. So I live tweeted Connor's inquest and sat in court and shared as much of it as was possible. And then this very odd thing happened and other family members started getting in touch with me and asking me if I would live tweet their relatives' inquests, which is just such a niche and horrendous reality, really. So since Connor's inquest eight years ago, I have live tweeted over 20 inquests of um, learning disabled and autistic people who have died utterly preventable and premature deaths from things such as constipation, malnutrition, literally not bothering to feed someone in a hospital, and witness seizures, and things like chest infections and pneumonia. And this, obviously, is not acceptable. So I just want to talk a little bit, put this into a wider context, I suppose. We have known for decades that people with a learning disability and autistic people are dying prematurely. We've known this for years. And we know that hospitals, use that word very loosely, especially assessment and treatment units, are unsafe. Horrible things happen behind closed doors. We have kidded ourselves and congratulated ourselves that long-stay hospitals are closed in the United Kingdom, but they are not. The spirit and culture lives on. For example, St Andrews at Northampton, which warehouses hundreds of people, Causton Park in Norfolk, where three people um, died premature preventable deaths, We've had Winterbourne View, and then a few years ago we had the abuse at Walton Hall, both uncovered thanks to tenacious undercover journalists. There's been a lot of activity following this, and very, very little progress. Recently, in preparation for this, I shared a Twitter thread where I traced the non-progress since transforming care since Winterbourne View, and we've had an, over a decade of performative scrutiny and non-action. Over 35 reports published, and yet we still have over 2,000 people stuck in assessment and treatment units, and there, there's a revolving door. There's a lack of community support and a perpetual risk for readmission, as Alexis mentioned earlier. Individuals' human rights are routinely ignored, people are subject to restraint, seclusion and segregation, and to quote Norman Lamb in 2018, there is a culture of looking at things again and again but not doing anything about the conclusions that are reached. And that is wholly unacceptable. So that's what's happened, and now what's happening? Well, Norman Lamb, and this is the frustration for me, we know all of this. I mean, I'm not saying everybody here necessarily knows all of this, but we do know why this happens. So Norman Lamb identified three perverse incentives that were preventing change in May 2019. Uh, no, sorry, in July 2018. And his three perverse incentives are as relevant today as they were then. Number one is the responsible clinician of the containing provider are the ones who are responsible for making decisions and deciding whether someone can leave. How is that possible? You have someone contained in a unit and the person who is containing them, who is getting paid thousands of pounds a week, not them personally, but their employer, to keep this person in this unit they get to decide whether they leave or not. It's just broken, it's a broken system. There's an absolute failure to invest in community provision. We know people should be in the community, but we do not have provision in the community to either support people to live their daily lives or when they're in crisis. And the third perverse incentive, which Norman Lamb highlighted, was the extraordinary and wholly unacceptable exclusion of individuals and their families from decisions about their care. And that happens today as much as it happened then. And I have the privilege of knowing so many amazing families, bereaved and otherwise, articulate, lots of middle class, really on the ball families, not all of them, but some of them, and if they cannot keep themselves and their families members safe. And so what the, what the system does is we paint the individual as the problem, and then we paint their families as the problem. We say they have unrealistic expectations. Shortly after Connor died, um, the Trust produced a briefing about Sarah's blog, a briefing about her social media activity after they allowed her child to drown in a bath. Screwed up. Um, so earlier on this year, I was reporting from the Wharton Hall trial um, 
which went on for weeks. And what, there are just a few things I wanted to highlight which was discussed there. So one of the things is closed cultures. Bad things happen behind closed doors. The second thing is the monstering of people under the pretense of hospital treatment. The language that's used, the othering of people, as Alexis said. The power that professionals hold and the power of the status quo. The Safeguard Review found there was an illusion of advocacy. Um, people continued to commission containment. And the role of restraint. The staff at Wharton Hall were trained in MABO, a restraint reduction technique, before they set foot in that institution. They told the court, some of them, that they were scared of the patients before they had ever met them. Now, if you train people into how to flat, flatten someone on the floor with six other colleagues before they have ever met someone with a learning disability or autism, is it any surprise that they don't see them as fully human? They didn't have training in learning disability, they didn't have training in autism, they had manual handling, first aid, and fucking restraint training. And then we wonder why they treat people like animals. Sorry. Um, and the other thing that happened at Walton Hall is a sidelining, ignoring, and deliberate deception of people and their families. And this is a repeated pattern. And in case anyone is in any doubt that this is a historic issue, this is very much still current. So the learning disability and autism statistics from March this year, which is the most recent data set, a new one goes out a week today, found. So earlier we heard from Simon that there were 2,600 people in assessment and treatment units when Transforming Care was announced to transform care. In March this year, the number was 2,580. 10, 11 years, 20 people less. 11 years. And 215 of those people had been detained for between five and 10 years, and 135 of them had been detained for over 10 years in a hospital unit. 650 people were restrained within the month of March, which is 25% of everyone who was detained at that time. And there were over 5,500 incidences of restraint, which averages out about, it won't be, it won't, you can't average it out, but if you could, it would be about eight and a half restraints per person. And this is hospital treatment. So I guess I'm concerned about systemic apathy. I feel like there's too much performance. There's a systemic hand-wringing. And Barbara Keeley um, held a debate in April about the ongoing issues around detention of people with disability and autism that was attended by a grand total of five members of parliament. So this event was talking about the scandal in plain sight. And I think, really, there is no scandal. There is no scandal in plain sight. People are so apathetic, it's, it's not even known about. So, three things about how we might change. And I was saying to Alexis earlier, we were at the walk. These always feel a bit like platitudes, <laughs> so forgive me. Um, but my first one is that people need to keep living and loving defiantly. So it shouldn't be necessary, but the more the realities of life, good, bad, and everything in between, for people with a learning disability and autism is shared and known about, the more people should notice and take care. The second thing is commissioners need to stop commissioning and regulators need to stop regulating these spaces. I've just realized I've got a bit of legal speak here. I've grave concern <laughs> that there's an industry that exists in the learning disability space that creates this apathy I believe that there are care and support providers, charities, training providers, experts and consultants, and that is an awful lot of salaries that rely on the status quo. I don't understand how we're still here 11 years on with no progress if people really wanted change. And I don't know if anybody else saw it this week, but Lang Kelly Chase, which is a big um, philanthropy provider, charity, announced this week that they're going to abolish themselves in the next five years and they're going to distribute, redistribute their wealth. And one of their trustees says something that struck me. And Mara Laracy, she said, the aim of Lang Kelly Chase was not to hold the cult of benevolence in place, but to actually dismantle that. And I honestly do not know how many of our large learning disability and autism charities, many of whom are providers of inadequate and requiring improvement care that does not meet basic standards. I don't know how many of those honestly want to dismantle that. And I really think that we need a conversation about the role of 
learning disability advocacy charities who are also providers of utterly shit care, personally. Sorry, bad language. Um, so finally, um, I think people need to be in their local communities from cradle to grave. I think people need to be known, loved, educated, need to work, live and exist in their community. So they're not just shipped off to distant prisons without a community out, you know, outrage. And I think we need better suited community supports, including for people in crisis situations, crash pads, additional support for families and carers. And I think we actually need to remake the scandal because I don't think there is a scandal. I don't think people really tend to give a shit. Thank you, George. Another incredibly powerful piece of testimony, um, straight from the courts and inquests of, of Great Britain. Um, so, our final speaker is Amanda Tops. Everyone has spoken tonight a bit at the end about their vision, about how things can be, can be different in the face of what seem almost insurmountable odds to, to try and change things. And now we have Amanda, who is, uh, has worked as a consultant, a, a policy maker, and she has been working for many years on creating better support for people, with, um, people in the community, for people with learning disabilities, to enable them to keep out of these sort of abusive institutions that we've been hearing about. And I know Amanda from when I was editor of Community Living magazine, and she wrote a, a series of great articles for us, not only about what she thought should happen, but about what she was actually making happen in Lancashire, in um, networks of support that she was building for people. She's currently working for the Small Support um, Programme, which is an effort to, uh, well, she'll tell you what it is, but it, 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 uh, it is part of an effort to um, get people out of long-stay institutions and enable them to stay out of long-stay institutions. So I'll hand her over to you. Thank you. Um... Simon. And um, after everyone else speaking, I feel um, quite wrung out actually, and I don't quite know where this is going to go. So I'll start talking, and um, uh, I don't know if I can stand up. <laughs> I was just going to explain. I, would, I might stand up, but I'm just, I just feel so overwhelmed by what people have said that I don't know if I ha even have the strength to stand up. So I hope you would forgive me if I remain seated. Um, it's, it's hard to speak actually because. As you know, um, these things have been going on for far too long, and we've had policies in place for many years uh, from the government to encourage um, personalisation, what we call personalisation, which is really person-centred work with individuals who need whatever support they need. Um, some of us, we all need support, don't we? So, you know, whatever support people need, it should be there for them through the systems that we have. And as described, it sadly isn't. And going into those hospitals. I mean, I've not been an inpatient, but it's terrifying um, to see the policies that are in place in those places which actually harm people and make them unsafe and um, cause damage to them and cause uh, additional trauma. Um, so I'm working um, on, a, on a number of things, and I'll explain what I'm doing, um, and they're all focusing on building better support for people to get home. So... Sorry, I'm feeling emotional as well. It's really hard. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll try. So, my background is in 26 years working with a local authority. And I decided after 26 years that I couldn't stand it any longer because things just weren't changing. And obviously, I'd been in the local authority all the time. Personalisation had been um, a programme. So, when I say personalisation, I mean um, self directed support. That's people having their own budget to fund their own social care uh, called a direct payment or sometimes an individual service fund, if you're very, very lucky and you live in the right part of the country, I'll come on to that. So, um, um, if, if, you, if you need support, obviously, um, funding, um, it'd be great if it was flexible and you could choose it. And I think what people have described is that they haven't had choice. And when I've been working in the projects that I've been working in over the last few years, since I became self-employed, um, I found through talking to what we call experts by experience, that's people with lived experience of um, living in hospital, um, often under a mental health act, 
um, like a section, which means they cannot leave out of choice. Um, they, when they do get out, they haven't been offered the choice. So they're not offered the choice where they live. They're not offered the choice who they live with. And then we're surprised when that like breaks down. And I want to comment on, I can't remember who said now, um, about placement. This is, this is not a word we should actually be using ever, is it? Because it's a person's life. They are a loved one. They are a unique individual. They have gifts and skills. And our system is entirely based on a deficit model, um, as described by um, other speakers where we only really assess the needs based on the problems, the deficits. And actually, you know, all your family members, for good or bad, you know, we all have skills, we all have gifts, we all have abilities. And um, the work that I do with a, a number of different companies is all about looking at those strengths and the gifts and how people can contribute and build strong reciprocal relationships and networks with people so when they come back to their community, they, they've got a welcome. And I can, I can give a little example. I don't know where this is going, but I'll give a little example. There's a lady, a company um, I worked with called, uh, called Lives Through Friends, and um, a lady who'd actually been involved in the original Winterbourne scandal. And um, so, you know, she had quite significant needs and support needs, um, which was fine. Um, and she came out to live in a, in a home. But before she even moved into the home, her team around her had prepared some work for her. So they'd networked with the neighbours around where she's living, they'd networked with the local community, and she already, before she even came out of hospital, had a job uh, cleaning a village hall. So that when she came out, and there were problems, because there are always bumps in the road, and there are obviously issues because people have been so severely traumatised, um, either through the system or you know through their history, their personal history, um, the neighbours knew about her and they got to know her and she started cleaning the village hall and she hit this bump in the road where things were not going as planned and instead of the neighbours doing the NIMBY, oh we don't want this, what they did was they called round to the house and said, how can we help? And isn't that what you want? That's just a perfect example of how you build people's lives into a real community. And so that the care is literally in the community. <laughs> Sorry if I come out with any cliches. But um, that's just an example. So, I mean, I'm here to talk about some of, some of the... I'll try and talk about a range of work and not take up too much time, but, I've, but Simon will have to stop me. I did warn him he'll have to stop me because he knows I can talk for England. So one of the projects I'm working with, and some of my colleagues are here, which is great to see the support in the room, is a project called Small Supports. And it's funded by NHS England. Um, and it's... Um, hosted by the National Development Team for Inclusion with support from the Local Government Association. And it's basically, look, do, it does what it says on the can. It's, it's basically doing what the commissioners should have been doing for the last 30 years. It's uh, looking at how to support uh, and create good providers in the community. So when people are coming out of hospital, there are providers who want to work with people and want to create good lives with them and want to be tenacious and want to be strong and have good leadership within their organisations and stick with the person. So when, when there is a bump in the road, um, they will persevere and they will find a solution. And so we've worked with lots of um, small supports providers. It's a beautiful piece of research, quite a short piece of research, but a very good piece of research um, about why small supports work. Um, and on the back of that, there was some funding made available. And at the moment, I think we've got 11 or 12 sites and it's growing. So um, NHS England have funded the programme for another three years and there's going to be up to 20 more sites joining the programme. So what it is, is looking at um, values, really. Um, and the purpose is, is to create small providers who've perhaps never done it before. So they might be a social worker or a commissioner or a person, a family member. They might be a lone disability nurse or a mental health nurse. And they'll come together and they'll set up a business or a charity or a community interest company. Uh, and the small supports programmes across the country in England will support them to do that. So the idea is that they stick to these nine criteria and you can look at the National Development Team for Inclusion website to find those criteria. Um, but the main thrust of it is, it's to be person-led, and the person's going to be at the heart of the decisions and the choices, exactly the opposite of what we've heard uh, today. So the idea is that they stay small, 
and local because they they are already built into that community so they can help the person get back built back into that community um, they also are small because um, they know everyone within their organization so you don't lose sight of everyone if there's a problem you know it's gonna you can always see it coming you can you can see it coming and so you can work move quickly to uh, resolve the problems and the issues with the person and with the person's family uh, the person and their family are involved throughout. And the, the, the model, I don't know if we call it a model, but um, <laughs> the programme really looks at using um, personal budgets. So the key to this is having the maximum flexibility because the person is in control of their budget. So that's, we're expecting that's mainly through individual service funds and personal health budgets, um, which I haven't got time to explain, but I think you can look them up. Um, but basically it means that a third party or possibly the provider themselves will hold that budget on the person's behalf so that they can self-direct that money. And it also means that it can be flexible. So everyone's needs change, don't they? It can change daily, it can change annually, it can change monthly. And instead of having to go back to the social worker, having to go back to commissioning, the provider and the individual can flex that money through the, using the individual service fund or the personal budget. So that, that then creates, you know, endless possibilities really um, and the, the person is in control and in charge of that with, with whatever network of support they need to do that. So there are many other elements to it, I'm not sure if I'm running out of time, I'm looking at Simon, see, right, <laughs> I've got five minutes, where do I go next? So um, uh, I suppose I ought to talk about what we've done in Lancashire. Um, so I was, um, I started working in Lancashire on the small sports projects there um, and um, we recruited three providers um, and one of the main aims that we wanted to have was um, to run the program through uh, well to co-produce the program and this is an overused word we all know this and it's very rarely done properly and uh, we all get a bit twitchy about it don't we but actually the whole the pure model of co-production which our experts told me on a regular basis, which was fab, um, was to have people involved from the beginning and to have people involved at every step of the way. And that's what we aimed to do. And I can't claim it was pure co-production because I don't know if anyone can, but it was as close to I, I've ever managed uh, in all the years that I used to work with the local authority hosting partnership boards. So um, we had a team of nine experts um, who were all amazing and contributed in very in different ways throughout the project. But to me, they were the, the gold of the project. They kept it true to its values. Um, they were challenging in the sense that they would tell their stories and it would help us realise how far off the mark we were in that local authority. So it would keep us true, it would keep us direct, it would keep us focusing. They were involved in actually a, a panel to um, recruit the providers and so they chose the providers and were part of that process. Um, so yeah, they were involved, and I think that's what made it, to be honest, that was what made it so so good, really. So the three providers that we recruited are now all starting to work with individuals and get them out of hospital, and I think um, we've got about five individuals who are being matched, and the aim is that we, we don't choose the match. We, we perhaps identify people who might want to get that level of support, but actually the person themselves has to choose, the person themselves gets the opportunity to meet and work with the provider, and then if they want to work and choose that provider, then they can. So um, it's, it's one of the options, we like to say small supports is one of the options, it's not, you know, we're not trying to push it as the option, but it's one of the options. So yes, um, I think to try and sort of summarise, um, what I found personally is that the Obviously, the small size helps the quality because it's relational. Um, people are known, so that's when I say people, it's everyone within the organisation is known by the leaders of that organisation. Um, there needs to be a high level of trust to make this work, and that's a high level of trust throughout the system. And I think some of the challenges that I've experienced are that um, the, uh, the commissioners and the system, you know, the, the local authority and the health authority, really struggle to take risk. They really struggle to um, do creative work, actually. They are struggling with resources, um, and they are struggling to take risk. And I think to get people a good life, you actually need to take risk. Um, and uh, you need to be creative and really, really work with them in a, in a dedicated way. You, you can't 
<laughs> you can't try. You've got to be utterly, utterly dedicated to doing it. And that's where the word tenacious comes in. People have got to be tenacious and, and be able to challenge the system, work around the system. We talk a lot about working around the system rather than working with the system. Um, with small supports, we talk about creating almost like a parallel system. We're not willing to use a tendering system where people are put up, I call it the social care slave trade, you know, where people are put up with a pen picture and provide a bid on that person to support their life, not even knowing that person. Person. How is that possible? Um, with small supports, it, like I say, it would be more of a matching process so that people get to meet the person. And it's a very bespoke support, so it's, it's the, the, individ, the, the staff support will be um, created around the person, with the person, and so will the housing. So everything's very, very bespoke, very, very individual, so the person has the choice throughout that process. Or it could be, be their family as well, who gets involved in their network of support. And so we need people who are open and transparent, people who are honest, and just as some of the other speakers have said, it needs to be real, it needs to be human. You know, didn't services used to be called human services? We seem to have got away from the whole concept of, of services being human, don't we? We want to put the human back in human services and away from this sort of command and control hierarchy, which was described earlier with the you know, responsible clinician having all the power. That shouldn't be happening. You know, the, we need to bring, bring, people, bring, bring things away from the terms like patient and service user to citizens. We need to actually... Um, view people as citizens, not view people, they are citizens. You know, the, the values of inclusion that Helen Simmons talks about, fantastic values, if you've never seen them before, go and have a look. But those are the values we need to be, to be working to. It's just so vital. Shall I stop there, Simon? <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, Amanda, and... Um, um, I'm very aware of just the incredible amount of work that is going in from Amanda and other people around the country. Really complex work to do stuff that actually should really be quite simple. Um, you know, if we have the attitude shift that the other speakers each spoke about at the end of that bit, actually these things would be simple. They wouldn't be complex. People wouldn't be having to work, work around um, systems or set up parallel systems to the ones that are that are provided at great expense um, elsewhere. Okay, well, I think you'll all agree we have had um, four incredible um, speakers this evening and heard some of the most powerful testimony. I'm aware, looking out at the audience, that some of this testimony is, 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 really, is really difficult, and we know from the speakers themselves. The sad fact is that these are things that are, that are happening, and they are that difficult, and they are that, um, they are that terrible. So we needed to do this in this event to, to, to start to talk about these things and, and, and what can be done next. So first of all, can we just thank our speakers again? <laughs> and, um, I know there was an incredible personal commitment into, into make, um, making, giving some of those talks. Now what we're going to do now, we would like to throw this open for debate and discussion and contributions and any questions that you want to ask the panellists. We're going to do a very complicated microphone switch, so someone's going to come and take this microphone from me, and it's Emma, so uh, that's... I'm still going to talk to you. So that's going to be the roving mic, and then we're going to try and use this mic and knock, not knock over our bottles of water when we're passing it to each other, so, okay. So anybody would like to... Um, say anything, contribute to anything. Hi. Um, it really is very stunning, isn't it, to keep hearing the same old crap. And I think, you know, we've got to say it as is, because it is utterly disgusting that we allow, and we do permit people to die, to suffer, um, and we suffer, we, we're complicit in that. Um, some more so than others. But what I want to talk about is a balance of power shift. Professionals, you're right. This rhetoric's about sort of engaging and all that. That's really quite a load of rubbish and it's a lot of hot air. We need to flip the narrative completely. We need, if we're serious about really changing and saving and enhancing lives, we need to make sure that we have three co-national directors for learning disability. One, a parent. One, a person with living experience. A person with learning disability themselves. 
and the third person, professional. So you get a two to one split, power shift straight away. Then you have a panel to hold them to account, made up of 51% people with a learning disability, 34% family members, and the final 15%, and the least relevant, professionals. And they should be held to account and develop and deliver improvements for development of the training, quality, monitoring, and have the accountability and responsibility for the purse strings to develop the future of services. Now, if the country is serious about trying to help people who live on the margins of our society, this could be done for many, many other people. It doesn't have to just be for people with learning disability. The other issue we've also got is throwing in people within the mix. So, People with a learning disability are different from people with a learning disability who have autism. And people who are autistic are different from both of those other groups of individuals. They are not the same. Sadly, there seems to be a merging of the, the two or the three in that sense. But my first point really is about a balance of power shift and taking away, stripping away the power from the professionals. Because those who believe that the professionals don't hold the power, they're lying to themselves and lying to the, to the future of people's lives. Because they do. And you've articulated it very well. And as a professional, I'm arguing for us having even less power, and I'd be delighted to have less and less, because I don't think the power should be with those that know very limited amount, like myself. Thank you very much. I'm glad we're videoing this so that we can keep some of this. Anybody want to respond to that? Or... I don't think much needs adding to that. <laughs> Yes, thank you. I'll do eat it. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly, the, exactly that about the power shift. Exactly. And what I've experienced is that the systems won't relinquish the power, even though the policy says that they should. So that, there's, a, there's a tension there, isn't there? So when we talk about using individual services and personal health budgets, that is one thing that will shift the power. But when you look at the national picture for people, for local authorities that are using individual service funds, um, there are very few who are actually really using them. So what they'll say is um, they are have individual service funds in their local authority. What they mean is that is a payment mechanism. It's not a pure individual service fund. So there are more than two, but I only really mainly know of two areas that are doing this really well. And one is Wakefield, and one is in Dorset, I think. Bill, you might know some others. But... Um, uh, one of our colleagues, called Christopher Watson from Self Directed Futures, he's been working really, really hard on developing the individual service fund mo model with local authorities. And part of the small support programme is to work with Chris on um, developing that further with local authorities. And that's the ability to shift that power and and to create um, a voice around the person that is different to the traditional voice and the traditional commissioning models. Um, and it's just one thing that we did. Again, this is where the experts are key, so totally agree with you. There needs to be the power shift away from the professionals. Um, we did, it sounds really simple, but it's really effective. In our, um, pro, in our project in Lancashire, we, you might have heard of this, but we used what we call listening rounds in our meetings, and everyone had exactly the same amount of time. So there was an equality just built into that really, really simple technique. So instead of the powerful voices always being heard and the quieter people not being heard, everyone had the exact amount of time. And if they wanted to pass, they could pass. If they wanted us to come back because they needed more time to think, we came back to them so they could listen to everyone else and then contribute. And there was the dynamics were different. And so that's just a very simple model that I found really, really powerful. And I know it doesn't solve the problem, but you know, you've got to start somewhere, haven't you? But I agree, you know, with the, the whole the national and regional would be amazing to see, you know, more uh, people with lived experience involved. So thank you. So. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Amanda. Uh, yeah, you do have to hold it really close to make it work. Um, right. Anyone else? Um, hello, um, my name is James. I want to thank the panel because I was really inspired um, by what everyone said and my manager sent me here and I wasn't sure what, what, to make, what was going to be here. So I've been so um, happily surprised, so thank you. One is um, at the organisation I work for, we're, we're trying to get commissioners to embrace individual service funds and we've worked with people like Chris in terms of training. But it's so hard to get commissioners to give it a go because they're so concerned about resourcing and budgets and they want to see the saving 
And it's not that that is, I know that that's not a factor in their lives, I know it's a factor in many people's lives having to deal with budgets going less than they need available and stuff like that. But the point that I really wanted to make was housing, as in the lack of housing and the lack of affordability. So people sort of say, you can't leave on. Well, we, you know, we have a housing department who have real struggles at the moment because landlords are giving up their houses, selling them, which means we have to find somewhere else. And the affordable housing isn't there. Okay, I came from Brighton today, which is maybe a particularly acute memory place, but it's not really, you know, why should you have to choose, you know, a, sh a massively shared house in London? Um, for something that could be a house with several bedrooms in other part in other parts of the country, I think they need, and I think that's a big issue that doesn't seem to always be put into the mix. So I just wanted to raise it. It's maybe not a question, but I thought it was worth saying. Thank you. I have to say, I've gotten them falling the old folks anyway. Um, I know it's not about money, but sometimes things are measured in money. And I, I, so I wanted to pick up on your point about people saying we can't afford this. We've started doing research into the, into the costs of supporting people to live in person-centered, highly individualized, community-based support. And it is cheaper. It costs us more money to keep people in the kind of institutions that we spoke about, that were spoken about, than it does to develop and support people to live in community-based services. You can also measure the increase in the quality of people's lives, the relationships people have, people getting work. But if anybody tells you community-based support is too expensive, that's a lie. The other truth in this is that People have set up incredibly exciting community-based supports of the type that Amanda was talking about, using exactly the same commissioning and legal frameworks that other local areas are saying can't be used to set up community-based support. So, what am I trying to say? Everything that people need to establish person-centered community-based support is already in existence it's just a lot of local authorities and trusts are choosing not to do it. Thank you, everybody. Um, George Fielding, I founded this social care company and after many, well, very quickly realised that the ethics of the industry are just not something that I want to be associated with, but um, to, to, both of my, um, to both of my predecessors' comments, um, there is a point around private equity in social care um, that never gets the, never gets the amplification. Um, who, who, who owns these, who owns these uh, homes? Um, where do local authorities turn to to place or to find uh, homes for uh, for people requiring support, um, even when the support, even when the devil is in the private equity, um, where, even when they find the perfect house, the the commissioning is so slow that the markets move, so the, the so the property is sold before b before b before colleagues of mine can actually get the care agreed. Um, the the um, I I know I know that you know there is uh, the reach stands and many things that good practice that have got, gone on for, gone on for years but you know how are we in a coordinated way going to communicate to policymakers to that to solve social care you need to solve housing and create and create uh, accessible housing that is owned by the community and um, and in a way kind of lace that into maybe the taking back control bill and, and other things that we've seen Keir Starmer and others talk about for the next general election. That's, that's a hope that I see but I don't see anybody 
making compiling the jigsaw, if that makes sense. That's really, really excellent. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Hi. I, I don't know if this is really appropriate, but I run a family-led team of staff, um, and I do it all on my own, and we've been cited as an example of excellence in the building the right support. I have had no support from anybody, <coughs> even all the smaller organisations were too small for small supports. Anything you want to join me you have to buy into. I have fought tooth and nail for 10 years. My son uh, is a friend of Connor's, and Sarah supported me when my son first came out of hospital. And we've been through a, a huge amount together. And families that are out there, my son isn't able to speak to himself. He couldn't represent himself. One of the first people that really spoke for Connor for me was actually Alexis when she spoke about what it was like to be restrained. And I, I felt I knew that my son, he can talk, but he hasn't got the ability. But I knew then that's exactly how he felt. And the, the families out there that do excellent work, I recently have had to really battle because I know what my son needed in his house. Um, I work with families all over England. I, I do my best to find information and share, and I was categor categorically told by commissioners, under no circumstances could my action be considered fatal. Because when love is involved, um, they're, they're on a loser. And, you know, I, I've actually said, I don't care if I go to prison. And recently I asked for a new computer for my staff, bearing in mind that I've saved them £80,000 most year. I have a huge budget, which lots of little professional uh, private providers when I ask them to come and join me, or can we share some training, they're delighted because there's a hope they might get my budget. You know, so that's what they're, that's what people are after. But when it's not, I'm not, I'm not relinquishing my budget to anybody because I know that my son gets exceptional care. And like Alexis says, it's day by day. It could all go tits up tomorrow, but it's excellent. And I provide a team of staff every single bit of training I have sourced and done myself, and I was fortunate that I had to help professional in the first place. But I, I go to talks, so when recently we were at school, people are talking about this being enlightened. We've been doing it for years. And it's really difficult, and it's very difficult for professionals when they have families out there that know so much more. You know, the difference is we don't move on. We've got that historic history and knowledge, and I think we've got to do more to support families rather than small providers, because all providers and making money. I'm being asked why my staff are paid so much. I was also asked last week, why haven't I got PBS involved? Why haven't I got this involved? Why haven't I got that involved? Because I've maintained keeping my son out of hospital for four years, totally on my own, by saying thank you very much for what you were offering. You know, it, it was damaging. Absolutely damaging. So we managed to achieve that. And I said, you know, yes, you've got to be audited, but I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to let you send somebody in to tick your boxes. What you need to be saying is, what are these families that are managing? What are they offering? Let's learn from them. And that doesn't happen because it's so threatening. And it's so, they can't accept the fact that there's so much expertise in families. And if one more person says to me, I'm an expert of my own child, I want to scream. We're all experts of our own child, but we are experts of the system. And many of us have learned and read. We spend, I probably work 18 hours a day researching, finding out stuff to make sure that my son doesn't go into hospital, but hopefully he'll be safe before I die. And after a long battle, he's now just going to be moving to his own home across the road, which everybody was against. Now they're bringing more houses into our village. It's absolutely awful, the battles that we have to go through. And I think we've got to support families and listen to them, because they really do have the skills. I just want to say that. <laughs> Like when, when some people live on the street and they haven't got any homes to go to and they need homes because it's not nice to live on the street out there because they haven't got any homes to go to. They haven't. And it's, and it's good to have new homes for other people. It is. Yes.
Um, hi, I just wanted to talk about the, um, I think, increasing trend of criminalising um, people that react uh, badly, as some people would say, in these treatment centres. Um, I've got a family member who was uh, a woman diagnosed quite late with autism in her late teens. Um, she was off a section, but she was still in a hospital voluntarily. She tried to hurt herself and she called for help and the alarm wasn't working, so by the time they found her, she needed CPR and was covered in blood that they didn't really know where it had come from. After a very traumatic two days, um, they tried to restrain her again and she reacted violently, as you would if you died and the same people were trying to come at you again, four people. She also ran away and she was sort of getting herself together again and a few months later she was served with a notice that they were charging her with assault. And uh, that's now gone through uh, one level of the court system and she's now going to the magistrate's court um, and trying to defend herself. She's been advised to plead guilty. She's saying she doesn't want a criminal record. She doesn't remember it. She said sorry, which they have told her was a mistake because she's claiming that she knew what she was doing. Actually, she realised what she'd done and said she was sorry, because she was, because she's a really nice girl. Um, and, and as a result, she's having flashbacks. She started self-harming again, and her life's going backwards. Her parents can't move on. She had a housing crisis as well. Um, you know, and, and it's just this worry, and I listened to a really awful Radio 4 thing a little while ago about how many young people kill themselves between the time when they're served with this kind of court notice and they get to court because they just can't cope with the thought of being locked up again, which is what she's terrified of. So I think this kind of trend, and, and we've sort of been told that this is maybe a test case to see how it goes and then there might be a, you know, if they successfully prosecute her. And one of the most awful things about it is when they read out the um, the, the, the staff's rec thing, they said, you know, she did say she was sorry, but she has to pay. And I think if you're looking at an 18-year-old child with a ligature around her neck, who's going completely sort of crazy because she doesn't know what to do, because she's been restrained and she, does, she can't bear her life, you would just think, there for the grace of God, that that's not my child. You wouldn't think that she has to pay for what she's done. So... Um, yeah, it's not really a question, it's just saying like this is a really worrying trend that I think we need to be really mindful of, that we don't start saying you're a criminal just because you're quite ill. Thank you for sharing that. I just wanted to add, um, having covered the Wharton Hall trial, that the criminal standard uh, to find ill treatment and neglect by care workers seems exceptionally high, like off the scale high. And yet a number of people who were in Wharton Hall had similarly been charged with criminal offences. And this, this, I think it's a real increasing and a very common problem where care workers are calling the police so that just so it goes on a record, not because anybody would ever be charged, you know, this is what we hear, and yet the reality is of course people will be charged. And if you're... If someone was assaulting me, which is what restraint is, then sure as hell I'd react back. And I don't quite understand how in these so-called places of hospice treatment, hospitals, if you went into your general hospital and someone restrained you, people would, there would be an uproar. So why is it that this is acceptable for some? I mean, it is, it is assault. When you've got six people yeah. pinning you down, it's assault. So thank you for sharing, but I, I do think it's, it's a much better problem and make sure you've got a really, really good lawyer. Oh. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm just I, going to say, I come from a background in care and um, support work in the NHS when I started and became a home manager and monitored a lot of contracts, care homes for local authority. We get very much stuck into residential bad support is living good. There's a lot of piss poor support delivered out there. There's a lot of very good residential. We get tied to the label. But what I would really like to see more of is shared lives where people live with families. And it is the best model. It works really well for people. I've just moved somebody into a shared life that meets their cultural needs, their religious needs, their communication needs. And it works. And it is not expensive. It is cost effective. It is personalised. And it's meeting what her dead mother wanted for her. We should be able to do this. It should not be beyond the 
the realms of possibility that we can't meet people's individual needs. But there is a lot of bad services out there, but there is a lot of good personal services. We just have to find them, nurture them, and pay them enough that they can attract staff and have the real deals. Otherwise, all we are left with is the big ones that don't really care. And as my mother used to say, the difference with some of the providers is the difference between shit and shite. Because they are the same, they're just branded very well, and they're very good at PR. And it takes a lot of time and effort to dig deep and have the time to say, actually, this is not delivering what we've actually wanted and commissioned and what this person needs. And families aren't listened to, but equally, individuals aren't listened to, and we don't have enough advocacy for people. So we don't hear people's voice, especially people with more complex needs who cannot communicate. Yeah, I just want, that's right. Um, I'll just quickly just respond to the other lady just to say that, you know, I think sometimes staff, you know, get caught in these cycles as well. And I can probably count on one hand the number of staff that were truly awful, um, horrible people. So I hope it's not come across that I'm staff bashing because that wasn't the intention. Um, and just responding, I'm so sorry to hear that that's, that's happened. Um, it's something that I see all the time, unfortunately, and, and that happened to me when I was in services. And, and I think one of the reasons is it's to justify a forensic pathway. You know, so that if, if you're in, or you're, you're due to sort of go back in, it just means that they can move you out of those acute settings and those PQs and just put you away for longer, I think. Um, I was told three to five years, and that's why I chose to, chose to escape. I was on my way to St Andrews. Um, so I think that is, something, that is something that does happen. And I think this zero tolerance, is also a problem. You know, of course, we don't want people, you know, attacking staff. Of course, that's not the right thing. But I think there's no understanding of that distress coercion cycle that I spoke about. You know, it's a response to the environment. It's a response to what's happening. You know, it's then an escalation of distress and an escalation of restraint, and people get caught in that. And what's so frustrating is that we hear, don't we? Oh, we're trauma informed. We're trauma informed. We're trauma informed. But actually, if we're trauma-informed, what we understand is that people have been traumatised, which is why they've ended up in the service, and that accrual of trauma means that there isn't that, oh, I'm going to hit you, that doesn't happen. It's there's 10 people on me, <laughs> you know, how can, I, how can I get out of this awful situation where I'm, where I'm being pinned down and I know that, that I'm probably going to spend a number of hours or days or weeks um, in a solitary confinement area. So I think, I think that... Yeah, but I'm just so sorry. I, didn't, I just wanted to, to say that, and I, I just wanted to draw attention to that trauma element because it, we, we're, everyone's saying that at the moment, but actually the reality of what, what that is is, is, not, is not understood. Thank you, and this will be, sadly, our final um, contribution tonight. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a support worker for a local charity organisation in Camden, and I've got three of my other colleagues with me. And we come down tonight to kind of support the, the kind of things you guys are talking about and the ideas that you guys are promoting. And I just wanted to say that, you know, I just feel that training for a lot of staff who work in this industry is just pathetic. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, you know, a lot of people are sent into what can be really challenging and really difficult situations without the qualifications, <laughs> without the understanding of what's actually going on. Um, and they, they kind of deal with it however they think, and it's not however they think, it should be done, you know, with actual training, with actual qualifications, and I've heard a lot tonight about, you know, a lack of family involvement and a lack of people actually taking the opinions of the people who go through these types of events and using that to educate themselves, um, and that was just, it, it inspired me so much because I thought, you know what, no, we don't, you know, a lot of training is not based around what people have actually experienced, it's about just preventing the issue when that's not actually how we should approach things, and training should be designed around, okay, how are we actually going to help someone rather than just prevent the problem altogether? Hi, sorry, I'm Nikki, I'm one of Chris's colleagues. Um, we currently, I currently support someone at the moment, and um, basically, long short is he, he, um, he's got ADHD, a bit of autism, and he had a bit of a crisis 
where he ended up being arrested uh, in the middle of a, a train station by the police because he was anxious, he was having a, you know, having a meltdown, he was stressed, whatever you want to call it, um, and he, he was seen to be doing this, so he was arrested and then taken to the police station, held in a cell and the whole thing that goes with that. Um, and then there was the, the option of, they had some psychiatric nurse assess him, and then there was the option of criminal justice or psychiatric, um, you know, pathway. So they, uh, his, his parent and the nurse sort of agreed that psychiatric pathway was, was better. Turns out it really wasn't. Um, that was back in April. Um, he's still in there now. Um, started to get better, then they over medicated him, and they've changed his drugs, and they've done this, and they've done that, you know. And it, it, he's still now in there, mainly because he started to get better, but it's housing again. They've got nowhere to put him, so he's got to stay there until they find somewhere. It's, it's just, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's my bit. <laughs> And, and yeah, and I just try and advocate for him as much as possible. I, I'm, I'm literally sitting there in a room with, there could be like five professionals around me and they're all like talking about it, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, I look straight at him and I'll be like, well, what do you want? And that is, that is me, that is the way I am. So, yeah. <laughs> I really feel I could have just sat all night and listened to people and thank you so much for your audience contributions because there was some fantastic expertise and knowledge and experience in, in this audience tonight. So I think we've seen that there are some huge problems that we're facing and they're systemic problems about the way social care and NHS care are set up in this country and how there is a systemic bias against the people we're talking again tonight which can make it almost impossible to make their lives better. There is an attitudinal bias, which everyone has talked about, where people are somehow seen as not quite human enough to qualify for full <coughs> human rights or to be seen as full fellow citizens and humans. And then there are just procedural difficulties where, listening to Amanda, Amanda, it is just so difficult to do things which should be really simple to radically transform people's lives. And as one of the audience contributors says, it costs less money if that's of interest to people. You know. um, however, given that we're facing enormous challenges and we can see how little things have moved on in the last 10 or 11 years since, since Winterbourne View, what is also brilliant is to have just such inspiring people around who are able to talk to about this and who are never gonna stop campaigning about this to see how many people there are in support of that in this audience. So we really hope that after coming here tonight, we're able to stay in touch with you, that we can send you information about what any of these guys are doing, that you can start to become involved in the, in the campaigns and the social media um, uh, communications that people are doing, and start to become involved in the campaign to make the shift that is really needed to, to, to make these changes. And so I just want to um, um, just say um, very briefly that I would like to thank um, Health, uh, Learning Disability uh, Network London for having the courage actually to um, um, host this event and to uh, have sponsored it and to have um, allowed people to hear such um, amazing speakers. We've been asked if it's going on tour actually, so. <laughs> We're looking into some mugs and t-shirts and a coach, so they're not getting away if they thought they were. Um, but um, it has really been, I think, I know a very difficult but also very inspirational evening. And Gabby's going to um, finish this all off, but I'd just like to thank you all for coming and to thank our speakers for everything they've said tonight. We're going to just close up now, so thank you. We'll have a chance uh, later on to have a chat. We're all going to go downstairs afterwards, so we'll catch up there. Okay, so just a few words, I promise. Um, so thank you for joining us this evening, and thank you again to our panellists. Um, it's been an absolute privilege to listen to you. And thank you for taking the time to be here and for the incredibly important work that you do. Thanks too to Simon Jarrett, who has been hugely helpful in organising this event. And of course, a great chair. So, 
It's not easy to talk about abuse, which is why we need to. We know that there are no easy solutions. Supporting people to live in their community often takes a myriad of people working together with the right resources, but probably more importantly, we, as we've heard from lots of people today, having the right mindset to make things happen. Key to getting this right is to actually hear and see the person and to listen to their families. And I know that sounds completely obvious, but it is a simple truth. But because without this, people with learning disabilities are denied the care and the support which should be created for them and not in spite of them. We need real partnerships with families, providers, clinicians, and those partnerships must be based on transparency and honesty with the ability to challenge as a cornerstone of that partnership. Being able to challenge when things aren't right mustn't come with an all too familiar throwback of this, well, this is a difficult family. Or actually, in this instance, we know best. Because that attitude brings and leads to the tragedies that we've heard of this evening. People with learning disabilities must have their human rights protected. They should live, live near their family and friends at home or close to home and make as many choices about their lives as they can. LDN London supports lots of people who without the right help and support would end up in assessment and treatment units. Isolated and in many ways forgotten, without the chance to live a good life. There are many stories of people whose lives have changed for the better when they are simply given the chance to be treated well, like a human being. At our community hub, we support extremely vulnerable people with learning disabilities to be active and properly included in their communities. And we help people to live good lives in the way that they want. But we know we're not the first to shine a light or a spotlight on what's happening in assessment and treatment units. Other charities have led great campaigns. And of course, our speakers today have been a shining light for years. But we need to continue to expose the abuse of people with learning disabilities and keep this whole issue as a national conversation until we see lasting change. So thank you, everyone. I'm just going to give um, just a few housekeeping. I'd appreciate it if you just stay in your seats for now. Our panel are going to go downstairs, where you can meet them downstairs. Um, did you know that? You're going to go downstairs first, where you can meet people and, and have a drink. Um, and also, just again, just to finish, on behalf of the whole panel, thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you.